record keeping and transport in an emergency. I'm going to give you just a couple of little tips on record keeping in an emergency as well as transport in an emergency. Um, so for record keeping I've I've included in your um, PDFs an, an example of a newborn resuscitation chart. So it's separate from the regular um, prenatal care or labor and delivery chart that you would use, and it's just for resuscitation of the newborn. So it's it's um, graphed in 30 second increments, so you can um, you can write down anything that's happening in those in that particular 30 second block. The, if the baby's getting um, uh, positive pressure ventilation, if the baby's getting chest compressions, if the baby's getting what the assessments are, what the observations are, what the responses are, if not when 911 was called, uh, you know, everything has its place and it would be done in a military time, so four digit timing. And it's kind of easy to do if, if one person is just keeping that. So what we will do, tend to do at a birth, is designate someone as the charter in an emergency. And each person has a role, and we've already done a scenario, quick role play of several of the main emergencies, shoulder dystocia, postpartum um, hemorrhage, and maybe, maybe an undiagnosed breach or something. And we would just run through those. And um, so just to keep in mind that for newborn or for um, emergency transfer uh, or transport, the things that you would want to be aware of is when you're, when you're charting, you want to have the information so that if you, when you go in, if, if you end up going into the hospital, um, you know, it looks, like you, they can see exactly what you did. Or if you're reviewed, maybe something happens and you have a review or you have a peer review of some kind. It's so much better if you've got this um, really clear idea of what you did every 30 seconds because 30 seconds is a big amount of time for a newborn baby. So just knowing that when you're charting to keep really accurate, 30 second increments for, for a newborn resuscitation. And when the head's born, this is for the shoulder dystocia, but just a reminder for charting, is to call out very, very quietly the 30 second in increments if the midwife wants you to do that. She might want you to do that so you know how long that head's been there. Maybe you might want to do some stimulation to get the, the contraction coming, but usually the contraction will come on its own when, it's, when, the, when the body's ready. So, um, but with the, um, with the record keeping it in an emergency, some of the things that you'd want to record are anything that you do. So whatever you do, like if you're, if you're stimulating, if you're drying, if you're repositioning the head, if you're, um, putting the baby, sometimes, you know, before you actually start full on resuscitation, a lot of times it's just get the baby in a, in a position where the baby can start to open its airway and breathe. It's going to take time. It's going to take maybe 30 seconds to a minute to transition onto room air. Leave the cord intact. The baby's getting highly oxygenated blood into its lungs. And this, this body, this, even though the lungs are, when the lungs have more blood in them, then they can hold the alveoli open better. So when a baby is in those first few minutes of transitioning into room air with the cord attached, it's getting a full one third blood volume. So you want to really support that. And so, you know, 
when we're charting these things, I think as practitioners, we we can chart, um, you know, these physio physiological things that we're doing. We're doing skin to skin. We're doing breastfeeding, you know, right away, right on the mother. We can even resuscitate that baby directly on the mother. And we talked about that before. We'll go into a little bit more about that. Um, but the other thing is about transporting. If you are transporting a baby, you should be transporting the mother too. If you're transporting a mother, you should be, in my mind, transporting the baby too, because those two should be together. It's better for the mother, it's better for the baby. And I have, in my practice, um, had great experiences with the EMTs and the fire department and the hospital staff and the nurses and the obstetricians. I've had really positive experiences where they actually respect your expertise as a, norm, as a guardian of normal birth in many cases, I believe. And what I've done is had the mother on the gurney and put the baby right on her chest and then I'll go right in the, in the ambulance with them. And I can t continue to monitor. And it's, it's, a, it's a great way, rather than separating the mother and the baby. Make sure that your charts are um, ready. Review the, um, the newborn and maternal transport sheets that I mentioned that will help you to know what are the important vital signs that you want to put on there. What important records from the mother's history? Was she anemic? Is she group B strep positive or negative? Does she have, you know, uh, RH negative blood or what is her blood type? Does she have any allergies to medication? Um, what medication is she on, if any? Generally, our women are not on a lot of medications, but sometimes we do collaborative care with practitioners. And then they are on, if the, it might be, um, it could be, what kind of medication? It could be an antidepressant. Some women are on medication um, and can stay within that realm of normalcy. And we collaborate with other physicians who are specialized, who, who um, prescribe the medication and monitor it, and then we kind of work collaboratively with that. So having that on the sheet, having any current vitals, current information about like specific information about that birth and delivery that has happened already. Um, so go over those, read those over, um, and get an idea of what kind of information you'd want to have on those sheets. And then having the charts filled in with the midwife, with her Doppler, or with any other, like her stethoscope, whatever she's going to need to continue taking vitals, and then maybe a clipboard with her chart and her pen. Helping her to um, have a smooth transport is always a good idea. And about transport, um, the MANA statistics are showing uh, a very low transport rate, under 5% for most um, low-risk midwifery clients with a skilled, trained practitioner at the delivery and continuing with the continuity of care model. Um, however, you know, there are times when um, we do need to transport. And according to the MANA studies, which I think are very interesting, this is a really unique study that's been done on the home birth or the out of hospital midwifery model of care or the aspects of the midwifery model of care when you're working in a low resource environment like a home or a birth center. Um, so I think that if, if that happens, if you do have to transport, um, just know that like Statistically, this MANA study, they had only, a, um, I think it was one, or okay, this is the farm. The MANA study was lower than 5%. The farm Midwest in Tennessee, where Ina Mae Gaskin started out, um, and they're still going there. They're still doing these births, and they've collected their data over the years at the farm in Tennessee. 
and I think they had a 1.7 cesarean rate. 1.7? Well, doesn't that just kind of show you that if they're having a 1.7 cesarean rate, rate and the United States have, has an average of a 40% cesarean rate, maybe a little less in some areas, a little more in others. Hmm. Interesting. And, and you know, we know that surgery and intervention does, it's a severing. It's really, it takes away the ability to easily support physiologic birth if it's a cesarean. I mean, it's hard for the baby to really get the squeezing it needs, get all the, that whole passage through the birth, birth canal is a very vital part of the newborn's physiologic transformation into, into life. It's all designed perfectly for a reason. So when we do cesareans unnecessarily, we increase trauma to newborns and we increase their, their, um, their, their trauma, uh, like they, they can continue to have that trauma for their whole lives until they figure out how to release it. So this has been shown in studies and research. People have actually found out this stuff, that trauma stays with you. Dr. Peter Levine is a trauma researcher. You can, you can read his book called Healing Trauma, if you like, called uh, by Dr. Peter Levine. He says that when we have trauma and then we have it, un it's unresolved, like in a newborn baby who might have been separated from its mother at birth or born by cesarean, that's a trauma. So that trauma is actually imprinted in the baby and it sets them up for anxiety, insomnia, all kinds of problems later on because of PTSD and trauma. We don't know how huge that impact is. And there's evidence to show that gentle birth creates a more uh, balanced mental, emotional, physical body because you are centered in that bonding and that gentle imprintment of peace. So you don't go through your life just feeling like, what the heck happened to me? You know, and a lot of people have a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of depression. I'm not saying it's all from this, but I think that it's a good place to start. If we can start to create intact, you know, like Robin Lim says, intact capacity to love and trust. Robin Lim. She's, she's the, the mother of this transformation in our world right now. She's the mother of that. And we're all in labor. This, this, this world is all in its own kind of allegory. The labor of the, of the Mother Earth to change, the shift the paradigm so that the human rights of babies and mothers are honored and families, the family, like I said, as the center, and we are the guardians of birth. All the best to you. Take care.